We're continuing in this series on Israel as a type of the church. <clears throat> I do want to emphasize once again that in Israel we have demonstrated how God works with a body of people. It is not that individuals are not of are not a divine focus because he speaks about the man toward this man will I look him that trembles at my word so so he does pay attention to individuals but in the normal dealings of God with men it's the group of people with whom you're identified that is a key matter God has a household the church is called a household of God it's called a whole family in heaven and earth that's named after Christ. So how does God treat his family? How does he go about working with his family? Well, it's demonstrated in, in Israel. Yeah. I feel it's necessary to emphasize this because somehow this, this perception has been largely lost in our day. And people have fallen into a sort of a self-centered religion and what I want and this sort of thing. But even in the world, there are certain advantages to being part of the right family. <laughs> there are some people in the world who would never have been anything if they weren't a part of this certain family. And in the kingdom of God, that's absolutely consistent. Before Israel, there were individuals God dealt with them and there weren't that many of them quite frankly there was Enoch there was Noah there's Abraham Isaac and Jacob and then you have to go to the Joseph you have to go to thinking after that <laughs> about individuals but have but all of the prophets they wrote they didn't none of the prophets wrote to individuals they wrote to a body of people. And we're going to touch on this aspect of the divine character tonight. That in Israel, he demonstrates how he gives messengers, sends messengers to his people to warn and to tutor them. Which means salvation doesn't make you self-sufficient. The fact that uh, God calls a nation doesn't mean that each individual of that nation can stand on their own two feet. It's not the way it is at all. Even though in some respects there are individual benefits, for, a, but they are always for the person who presses closer, looks more intently, has a more of a focus like Paul. Paul was part of the body of Christ. In fact, he was set in the body. He was a, a, for a group of men that were a first rank, first apostles. So he was in that category. But he never forgot that he was part of this family. And any special benefits he received that the rest of the family didn't necessarily receive was because he extended himself further. Now, there's no known limits in the family of God. There's no known limits as to how far you can go or how much you can receive. It, it, there's no known cap on that. God, from God's viewpoint, there probably is a cap, but it's determined by your role in the body of Christ. Anything that extends beyond who you are in Christ, it would be superfluous to load you up That's right. if you couldn't use it. <laughs> see, I can see the sense of it. But that's what we want to look at tonight. Special messengers given to the people of God to warn and to tutor them. Now, again, I'm emphasizing this is God's manner. This is the way God is. I will tell you that no age or generation or body of people of any given time decline without having been warned. This is God's manner. And when there's a decline, 
there has been an ignoring of some word from God. Yes, some messenger that was sent to stop the backward motion. It just doesn't happen independently of that. Now, God is serious about this, as we'll demonstrate in his dealings with Israel. Now, Sister Annie read this one text. God told the prophet, they're not going to listen. So in any other arena but the kingdom of God, you wouldn't say it if people weren't going to listen. But see, more is involved here than the people. There's God's involved, the integrity of God. Nobody in the day of judgment is going to be able to say, if only you'd have paid more attention to me, I'd have never done this or that. I'd have never gone backward if I just had been given a little more opportunity. No one's going to be able to say that. Amen. This is God's manner we're talking about. Now, 2 Kings 17, 13 gives us a word on this. Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers, which was another name for prophet. Prophet emphasized what they said. Seers emphasized what they saw or comprehended. He sent these prophets and seers saying, Turn ye from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers at which I sent to you by my servants the prophets. He sent that word out. I'm serious about this. I didn't, I didn't send a word for it to be ignored. Pay attention to what I've said. Listen, brethren. There are Christians beyond number that do not take seriously what God has said. Amen. We just as well acknowledge it. It's not that we're being crotchety or critical. This is just the way it is. Some people have no trouble at all ignoring what God has said. But I will tell you that God is going to deal with that issue. He will not allow a person to get into glory who ignores what he said, no matter how nice they may appear. Now, notice he faithfully sent them. Don't. You're going down the wrong path. Stop. Stop. Don't do this. Second Chronicles 24, 19. Yet he sent prophets to them to bring them again unto the Lord, and they testified against them, as the prophets testified against the people, but they would not give ear. You say, well, why, why waste the time doing it then? Well, this is, this is God's manner now. Because he's going to be, he's showing that he, he does care about his people, yeah. even if they don't care about him. He does. He's demonstrated in Israel. Here's another word, Jeremiah 7.25. Since the day your fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt unto this day, I have even sent unto you all my servants, the prophets, daily rising up early and sending them. I sent this word long before things got out of hand. Long before this departure happened, I sent people, warning people about this. That's God's manner, see? Now, if you... We hope you haven't backslid, but if you have, and you will take time to review your life, you'll find that countless times when you were warned about this trend. Amen. Somebody said something about it. They may not even have known you were in a backward motion, but something was said. And you be, it, it's going to be mind-boggling on the Day of Judgment to see how many hurdles people went over yeah. to go backward. This is God's manner now. To warn them ahead of time. Here's Jeremiah 25, 4. The Lord has sent unto you all his servants, the prophets, going, rising early and sending them, but yet ye have not hearkened, but incli nor inclined your ear to them. See that? Rising up early. Plenty of time. God never lets things get out of hand before he says something. Yeah. This is not God's manner. That's why it's important that everybody, when, they, when they're assembled together in the name of Christ, it's important everybody be alert. Because if there's some 
slight inclination backward or a, a little note of slothfulness or neglect, it'll be spoken of in the assembly of the righteous. Someone will rise up and warn people, even though they don't even have the slightest idea that that backward bent is in you, it, something will be said about it because this is God's matter. He gets up early, way ahead of time, way before it's out of hand, uh -huh. and says something about it. Even, it, say, in our nation, whatever you may think about all the different preachers and teachers, there have been countless men who have risen up and warned people we're on the wrong road. They're still saying it almost daily. He'll have some messenger say, we got to get back to God. We're going the wrong way, and these words are going out. This is God's manner. And if a nation falls, it won't be because God didn't warn them. Right. Here's another word, Jeremiah 25, 4. The Lord has sent unto you all his holy prophets, rising up early and sending them, but you've not hearkened nor inclined your ear to hear. Jeremiah 26, 5, to hearken to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I sent unto you, both rising up early and sending them, but ye have not hearkened. <laughs> How many times he says this? Mm -hmm. Rising up early. I told you. I told you. Jeremiah 29, 1. Now these are the words of the of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent, un, sent from Jerusalem unto the residue of the elders. A letter sent to the residue of the elders. Did you know that? Jeremiah from Jerusalem wrote a letter to the residue of the elders, which were carried away captives, sent it, sent it to them in Babylon. And to the priests and to the prophets and to all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. So in Babylon, here comes a letter yeah. <laughs> from Jeremiah, it's written in Jerusalem, warning them, bringing things to their attention. Jeremiah 29, 19, because they have not hearkened to my words, saith the Lord, which I sent unto them by my servants the prophets, rising up early and sending them, but they would not hear, saith the Lord. So you got a case, do you, with a fornicator in the church? Something had to be said a long time before the thing got out of hand. There was a word said, well, how do you know? This is how God works. I don't doubt that there are people God speaks to them through what men call accidents. Mm -hmm. They will be privy to some discussion. They didn't go out of their way to hear, but in that discussion, something was said that they heard. Something was said to, designed to wake them up, bring them back to God. Some person happened by, looked like, that was from God who left an impression, I ought to do better. You ought to get up and move further. This is God's manner. Jeremiah 35, 15. I have sent also unto you all my servants, the prophets, rising up early and sending them, saying, Return ye now, every man from his evil way, and amend your doings, and go not after other gods to serve them, and ye shall dwell in the land which I have given to you and to your fathers, but ye have not inclined your ear, nor hearkened unto me. I right, come back. You're getting too far away to hear. Yeah. Huh? Well, this is happening. There are some people. Mm -hmm. There's a distance forming between them and God. Yeah. Uh -huh. So it's harder to hear God, harder to think about God. Uh -huh. God's, he'll send warnings. Oh, you're, the too big distance is too big. Close the gap. Uh -huh. Come back. Whatever. Oh, you say, well, I've got to do this. I've got to do that. I've got to get my education. I've got to take care of my family. I've got to secure my job as a... I married a wife and can't come, or I'm. There's a thousand different things you decide, but God said, close the gap. Don't shove off from this world at a distance from me. Right. Don't do it. It will not go well for anyone who leaves this world in a state of alienation and distance from God. It will not go well. And God sends messengers 
repeatedly. Every time you pick up your Bible, it'll come across to you too. Amen. Jeremiah 44, 4, Howbeit I said unto you, all my servants, the prophets, rising up early and saying, Oh, do not the abominable thing that I hate. See, some church people do not have any idea what God hates. Why don't they? They haven't had their ears open. You mean to tell me God wouldn't send someone with a word? Maybe it's when they were younger. Maybe it's when they were staying with grandma and grandpa. Maybe it's when they're with an uncle or an aunt. Maybe it's when they're on vacation visiting the church. But somewhere, God sent out the word. Don't do this thing. They did it anyway. See, it's going to be bad if you do if you. If you insist on ignoring what God said, well, just, just don't want to do that. Amen. Zechariah said a word about this. Zechariah 7, 12. They made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law and the words which God of hosts has sent in his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Yeah. Heart, you can harden your heart. You can make yourself impervious to divine summons. Yeah. It's called being hard-hearted or stiff-necked or a seared conscience. Or There's various terms to describe it. Some in the background, if you just listen, at the hour of temptation, if you listen, you hear a voice say, don't, don't do this abominable thing. You know better than that. You know you shouldn't do that. You don't have to be like an intellectual to understand this is out of order. This is God's man and I'll do this. And here's Jesus. Jesus himself speaks about this. Matthew 23, 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them, which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. No one's going to be able to say God didn't care. And when a person is tempted to say that, they got to mortify that temptation. They have to kill that thought as quick as they can, cast down that imagination. More often than you dare to imagine, more often as he sought to gather his people together. If you could see behind the scenes in this fair city, there have probably been numberless attempts made by holy men of God to get God's people together, and they just are so obstinate they will not do it. Do you see God's going to be justified in all of his sayings? Say, what if they did heed? Then he'd, then he'd enable them. That's right. That's what would happen. So you see the uh, statements made over and over, and God makes quite an emphasis of it, rising up early. Kind of comes over that again and again. I, I, I allowed plenty of time. I didn't let things get out of hand. From the human point of view, which is always the worst point of view, from the human point of view, people say, well, I don't know how this happened. I, how could I have done this? Well, that's not how God. God sent warnings. They just weren't given heed to. This is A lot of this is, I hate to bring it up again, but a lot of this is going to be laid at the feet of Babylon, who has developed a religion that makes people comfortable when they're alienated. And the seriousness of this, it can't be overstated. God's going to judge Babylon with a sore judgment. Amen. It's going to come crashing down to the ground. It's going to do so suddenly and without remedy. There's not going to be, you cannot convert Babylon. You can't change it. The, the announcement's already been made. You just as well try and change the nature of the devil yeah. as it try and change the nature of Babylon. It can't be done. Why? Because God has already extended more than enough effort to have corrected this situation. But people didn't pay any attention to it. Now let's just take a moment to look at this, this principle, how that God does this. 
Again, a word from Jeremiah 14, 14 through 16. Then the Lord said unto me, the point I'm going to make here is that there are false prophets that say they're sent from God. The prophets prophesy false, prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination and a thing of naught and the deceit of their heart. Therefore thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that prophesy in my name, and I sent them not, yet they say, Sword and famine shall not be in this land, in the land. He, Jeremiah said it was going to be. They said, oh, it's not going to be. By sword and famine shall these prophets be consumed. And the people to whom they prophesy shall be cast out in the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and the sword, and they shall have none to bury them, their wives, nor their sons, nor their daughters, for I will pour their wickedness upon them. Does God do something like that? Yeah. Yes, he can. Amen. Yes, he can. When you see, this is whether it's a nation, uh -huh. nation that forgets God, Scripture said it'll be turned into hell, all the nations that forgot God. They got kind of a start with God in mind, but they've veered way off course. God's going to, wickedness bears bitter fruit. And he said, I'm going to pour it out on them. They're, going to, they're not even going to have time to bury their dead. There won't even be anybody there to give them a dignified burial. That's how God is about people rejecting what he has said. Now, this, this is under the law we're reading about. You can consider this in view of what he's done in the great, in his great salvation, so great salvation. You can imagine people who neglect that, God's mind toward this. It's not good at all. Jeremiah 23, 21. Have not these prophets, yet they... I, gave, I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. <laughs> they come telling you that the main, the, the thing we got to address is the family situation. The family's falling apart, and if we don't get the families together, nothing else. He said, I didn't send these people. My son said a man's foes would be those of his own house. That's not the message I'm sending. I'm saying stop doing the abominable thing. Yeah, You're irritating me, God is saying. You're provoking me to anger. And once it breaks forth, there's no calling it back. Once the fire goes out from God, that nothing can stop it. Why, one day he, he slew 70,000 people in a day. God's rest, 70,000. Another time he slew 23,000. Wrath went out. One time Moses sent Aaron out with a censer. Take the censer, run among the people. Before He, he did before the plague stopped. 23,000 died, I believe. This, before the plague got stopped. See, once the thing breaks out, once God's pushed over the border of his long suffering. Maybe we're seeing something like that begin to happen. Could very well be. If it is... <laughs> This is not the time for distracting messages and popularity votes. And this is not the time. Not now, not during these, right. these days. Jeremiah 7, 27, 15. I have not sent them, saith the Lord. Yet they prophesy a lie in my name that I might drive you out. What? What? They're preaching a lie to you so that I'll have a good reason for kicking you out of my land. They're delivering a message you want to hear, but I don't want to give. So I'm going to, I'm going to boot you out of my land. Maybe some people didn't really leave the church because 
there's too much hypocrisy in it. Maybe they left because God kicked them out. Did you ever think about that? There's some people he just eliminates. Gets rid of them. That's how God is. Amen. <coughs> so many of them that... Uh, many false prophets speak of physical danger and jeopardy and catastrophe, but don't warn the people about spiritual jeopardy. They may, they may talk about famines and so forth. That are very true. We don't say that this is not possible. Mm -hmm. But the real danger is not famine. Amen. You can recover from famines and God can keep you alive in a famine, yeah, the right. scripture says. But we're not talking about that type of thing here. The Lord has sent unto you his servants the prophets. You didn't uh, pay attention to them. Here's Jeremiah 35, 15. I have sent also unto you all my servants, the prophets, rising up early and sending them, saying, Return ye every, one, every man from his evil way and amend your doings, go not after the gods to serve them, and ye shall dwell in the land which I have given to you and to your fathers. But ye have not inclined your ear nor hearken unto them. I told even to every man, leave off these evil ways. Come back to me. Make me the main objective of your life. So you see there's uh, much in this, how God warned the people. He makes a point of drawing your attention to it. Solomon once said, He that being often reproved and hardeneth his neck shall be suddenly destroyed, and that without remedy. Amen. This, is, this is God. This is, this is the God with whom we have to do. He extends himself to warn the people. He does it again and again and again, and pretty soon he destroys them, and there's no way to recover from it. That's the way God is. Now let's look at the church as an antitype. Has God continued to do this? To send forth people that sound the warning and call the people higher and urge the people not to sin. John says, well, you remember there were false prophets back then. There are false prophets. Many false prophets are going out into the world. First John 1 John 4.1, a lot of them, so filled with them. To try the spirits to see whether they're from God. <laughs> Make sure the message that you're hearing is really from God. There are prophets that do not warn the people of God's reaction to what's going on. See, a lot of people, they're preachers and teachers. You say, well, how come you talk against them? Because someone needs to talk against them. There are preachers and teachers that are so unacquainted with God, there are causes for damnation going on right under their nose, and they are so stupid, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like an ox yeah. mm -hmm. or like an ostrich, that they can't see how dangerous the circumstance is, and they're coddling the people God is condemning. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that's happened. Yeah. And they do it for a position in the earth, this sort of thing. God takes due note of it. Jesus warned the people, beware of false prophets. Watch out. So not only is God going to warn the people, he's going to say, don't listen to everybody. If the religion is popular and the world condones it, something's wrong. Something's not right about that situation. Holy men appropriately warn God's people. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4.14 I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. I'm warning. You're on a path down there at Corinth that's not going to end up well. You've got to get off of this path. Touch not the unclean thing. Come out from among them, saith the Lord. 
You've got to, you've got to do this. This is not a popular message, I know. So what do people think if we do that? That's not even, that's the wrong question. That's right. What will God think if you don't? Yes, amen. What is God going to think? See, God warns the people. He not only tells them about blessings that are on the way for those who believe, he tells you curses on the way for those who don't believe. Yeah. The holy men appropriately warn the people. 1 Corinthians 10, 11, And all these things happen unto them, Israel, for in samples, and they are written for our, our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. 1 Corinthians 10, a classic text that tells how they all came out. They all went through the Red Sea. They all baptized in the Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate spiritual meat. They all drank of the rock that followed them. But with some of them, God was not well pleased. Amen. You think that situation does not exist now? Do you think for one moment that God is well pleased with everyone that says they're a Christian? Or if we want to get exceedingly personal, would you dare to assume that God is well pleased with everyone sitting in this room? He may be, but you can't, that's not a thing to be assumed. That's right. You've got to prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God Amen. by submitting yourself completely to him and giving your bodies a living sacrifice. If you haven't done that, well, do it. Don't let God have to tell you this every week or every day, tell you to straighten out your life. You don't want that kind of admonition because there's going to come a time he won't give it anymore. He'll destroy you suddenly without remedy. But if you give heed to him, he'll pour oil on your wounds. Amen. And he'll heal you and restore you, right. feed you and care for you. That's the way God is. If there was an Israelite that listened to God like David, Look at all that God gave him. Look what God gave him to see because of the tenderness of his heart. God Almighty, he has servants that warn him. Colossians 1.26, Even the mystery which has been hidden from ages and generations but is now made manifest to the saints. And then he warned them. The next verse he says how he warned them. Warned every man. I mean, this salvation is so great. Beloved brethren, you can't get by with ignoring it. Amen. It's that great. Yes. I think a person who uh, ignores God's salvation, they don't, they don't see it as a great salvation. They don't yeah. see it as a great deliverance or yeah. so great love. They don't see it that way. But that's the way it really is. Mm -hmm. And God will faithfully send people to uh, warn them Paul, for instance, Paul, he sent, uh, he sent, uh, the early church sent Barnabas to Antioch. They heard that the, there had been people turned to Christ in Antioch. So God, now remember he sends prophets, so he, they send Barnabas down there who saw the grace of God comforted the people and some progress was made. Yeah. That's God's manner. Remember, I'm pointing, pointing out is God sends people to edify and strengthen and build up his people and warn them he, he, this is what he does. So Barnabas is sent down there. Paul sent Timothy to Corinth because he could, he could be trusted to assess their situation, whether they made progress or whether they hadn't, see? That's God. God was behind this. This wasn't just Paul doing this. God is behind, behind this effort. And he also he sent Timothy to Thessalonica, find out how they were doing. This is God's manner. I think if you would trace back through our brief history here, there have been people that come to us from other parts of the world visited us and I think if you had the presence of mind to check up you'll find out that they brought some word mm -hmm. some word was delivered mm -hmm. brother Samuel I believe once said there isn't a place like this yeah. uh -huh. in the world he's the world traveler right. said this what does that do puff you up with pride 
No. Oh, no. That means let's keep what we've got and gain some more. Amen. That's a word. See, when someone says you've got a lot here, that's not said to puff you up. That's right. That said you're on the right track. Now keep on it. Yeah. Stay on the highway in the center of it, not out on the edge of it. He sends people to tell you. To tell you that someone's going to rise up and say, we don't have anything like this where we live. Yeah. They travel long distance, come here because they don't have anything like this. What does that mean? You say, well, boy, <laughs> It looks pretty good for us. No, no, that's God speaking to us. Amen. He's saying, look, this is the result of your devotion to me. Now, now you need to be hotter. You need to be stronger. Amen. You need to go further. There's a whole lot to obtain yet. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what that's designed Amen. to do. Right Again, Timothy, uh, Paul sent to know of the Thessalonians' faith when he sent t Timothy. Want to know about their faith. I think God's sent us some people that wanted to know about our faith. They heard about us. Might not have been favorable what they heard, but they come to check it out. See about our faith. We don't want them to go away and say, yeah, they can't take more than 30 minutes either. Mm -hmm. It's got to be something distinctive. That's and he sends people to urge us to keep what we've got and forge forward and get more. Amen. That's God's manner. Paul writes to the Corinthians to correct them. He saw them veering off course, and he couldn't, <laughs> he couldn't just let that happen. He wrote them about it. Think what, he, think what he told them. Remember now, God rises up early. Sins to correct the situation. He wrote about a presence of a fornicator. He got right on that. Mm -hmm. He wrote them about taking each other to the law and suing one another. He got right on that. Mm -hmm. Matters regarding marriage. He corrected that. Misapprehension about it. He told them about being mindful of weaker brethren. They were they were flawed there. Some people doubt his apostleship, so he addressed that matter. He was an apostle. He warned them about provoking God. Are we stronger than him, he said. They had spiritual gifts, but they weren't using them properly. So he devotes chapters 12 through 14 to <clears throat> yeah. see rising up early before the thing, before the thing got out of hand, uh -huh. he sent a word to them about how to perfect certain things that was going on among them. And some said there was no resurrection of the dead, and he, he sent a word to correct them on that. And Paul, when he, he wrote to Rome, he dealt extensively about justification by faith. He had heard about their faith, but apparently this was something that wasn't all that clear to them, so he spends a considerable amount of time from chapters 4 through 8 Commenting on being justified by faith. God is sending them early, see? Sending them early, not letting them remain in a deficient state. They're making good progress, but you can... There are certain truths that without knowing them, the progress finally stops. Yeah, yeah. You need to make progress, you've got to have some additional kingdom information <laughs> that you can understand. And he sent them early to do that. He sent uh, to Rome. He told him about the inner warfare. It's, a, it's the only extended commentary on it in Scripture. James mentions it. Paul mentioned it to the Galatians, but he has an extensive word. Why? He, this is God's manner. He wants to teach people about areas that they're a little weak in or maybe they, they don't see clearly here. So he sends a messenger to clarify that, that matter. Or what about the attitude toward Israel? Some some evidently had, were, were kind of proud, and they thought, well, they broke off the Gen Jews so the Gentiles could be grafted in. He writes chapters 9 through 11 of Romans. He, he corrects that misconception because he won't let people think less of someone he chose yeah. without saying something about it. And he even spoke to them about governmental powers. There must have been some mis 
conception about that. He said, there's no power but of God. Yeah. Don't be kicking against the bricks all the time, against political power. I've got, I ordain political power yeah. to subdue iniquity and encourage goodness. Yeah. Now, if they don't do it, then I'm going to deal with them. Uh -huh. that's, not, that's not your thing to correct. That's what I'm going to correct. Right. Your job is to know that they're, no matter how unacceptable a president may be in our country. If with a discerning eye you will look back, you will find some evil they corrected. Yeah. It may have been like the only thing they did. Like King Saul, God raised him up to deal with the Philistines, and he dealt with that. He didn't do too well in other areas, but he, he dealt with God sent somebody to correct an issue. And so... God it warns the Romans about something like that and about matters of conscience. He spoke about that, that it's important you maintain a good conscience. It's not the answer all, but if you maintain a good conscience, then God will lead you. Yeah. He'll show you things that you really need to know. Right. If you really think that God doesn't want you to eat meat, all right, you live in that awareness, but do it unto the Lord, and then God will reveal to you the, the truth of the matter Amen. that this isn't what you thought it was why because that's God's manner mm -hmm. in the Roman case he sent Paul to address that mm -hmm. that matter to Paul to the Thessalonians he wrote about the second coming of Christ they were kind of garbled about that <laughs> well think of the churches that are messed up about the coming of Christ mm -hmm. just think of what a confusing subject this is the Thessalonians had some thoughts that they weren't like they hadn't invented a new theology. They just didn't understand about the resurrection and things like this. And so they thought people died and missed out on the whole thing of the coming of the Lord. So, but he sent a messenger rising up early to tell them the truth about the matter. And in the church at Philippi, they, need, they were devout people. But they needed to know more fully what Jesus, what it was involved in Jesus humbling himself. He was a lot more perhaps than they thought. So he opened that up to them. He needed to know what the proper motivation to live for God. So he shared out of his heart how, how he counted everything but loss. And see, he sent a messenger to kind of clear up hazy areas to the church at Ephesus. He developed God's eternal purpose like he didn't in any other epistle. He opened this thing up, which means that they needed to have this expansion. It weren't that they were bad. That's not the point. The point was they reached a point where they had to go further, and to go further, you had to see more. So he gave it to them. Church at Colossae, they were being exposed to false philosophy, and he, he wrote them about that, corrected it. Jesus sent John with a message to the seven churches of Asia. Five of the churches were in bad shape, but apparently nobody told them. So Jesus sends a message by an angel to John to tell him what he sees in those churches. And he said, I've got this against you. There's some things I got against you. You don't want, you don't want Jesus to have something against you. Yeah. This is not the person to have something against you. But he said, raised up a messenger and sent him to warn them. God sends preachers and teachers with the scripture to correct and rebuke and instruct in righteousness and so forth. Well, our, our assemblies should be a place of edification and as needed warning and correction. For them to be that way, everyone has to live close to God. Amen. And then God will speak. This is what God does. This is what God does. You'll find we have these scripture showers. God will speak. During those times, God will speak to certain things that need to be addressed. And he'll rise up early. He'll give plenty of time for the thing to be corrected. Various exhortations, various messages, various books, the epistles that are expounded, various themes that are developed. If we're walking in the light, God will through these God will speak that will open up avenues to grow further, that will cause us to see things that need to be corrected. 
and to see possibilities that need to be entered into. See, this is God's, God's manner. So our assemblies should be a place where this can take place, Amen. which means they can't, of course, be run by rote. Yes. Uh -huh. Or they can't, they can't accommodate the flesh. The flesh says, I don't like that. Just say, well, go home. Amen. We're not going to manage our assemblies to please the flesh. Because the assemblies intend to be an environment in which God can speak. And people that have a word from God are free to say it. And if comfort needs to be ministered, somebody can rise up and minister it. And so forth. I'll leave those words with you, Brother Gene.